Thank you. Um, so, with uh, members, we've closed uh, the public input, and we now go to local board input, and we will be hearing from our Great Barrier Island uh, community and board chair, yeah. Izzy, on the concept of establishing a dark sky sanctuary and accreditation for that. Welcome Izzy and uh, welcome Richard. Izzy, would you like to introduce <coughs> Richard and tell us about Richard and the concept? Absolutely. Thank you, Mr Chair, for your time this morning. Mayor Phil, councillors, independent Māori strategy board members, good morning. Yes, we're here to do a, a brief information item to, to you on our aspirations to gain independent dark sky accreditation for a sanctuary. The IDA is based in America and its mission is to protect the night skies for present and future generations. Now, as you may be aware, Aotearoa Great Barrier Island has some of the most pristine skies in the country. So we've done a lot of work, Richard on my right, ex-board member and resident in Trifena, and his wife, Jendi, have done an enormous amount of work in guiding us through this process. Now, the goals of the IDA, as they're known, is to advocate for protection of the skies, to educate the public and policy makers about night sky conservation, to promote environmentally responsible outdoor <coughs> lighting, empower the public with the tools and resources to help bring back the night sky. Now on the screen above, you will see various photographs that have been taken of the night skies on Aotearoa Great Barrier Island. So enjoy those as I hand over to Richard, who's going to talk to you a little bit more about planning stuff. Okay, thanks Izzy, and thank you councils. Um, we appreciate the opportunity. Um, the idea for this came when the preparation of a seminar that the Awana Rural Women was doing on Is There Life Out There? That seminar um, meant that we had a number of world-recognised astronomers visiting the island. They were amazed at the quality of the light and as part of the whole process, we realised we had a very small and short opportunity to protect the quality of the light sky over Great Barrier for the future, for future generations, and for economic development on Great Barrier and the wider Auckland. The basics, there is a lot of legal detail that we're working through, but the basics, what are the basics? Simply put, Limit the amount of light you need and limit the amount of light, light you use. Limit the intensity for outdoor light. Shield light, shade the lights, and have reasonable curfews. These are not too difficult. It's very easy on the barrier because on the entire island, we have precisely four lights that at the moment break the standard. And that's out of a 288 square kilometer area. The technical surveys we undertook to do this involved several trips around the Great Barrier Island uh, lasting all night for several nights. The readings we got, I'll put in very simple terms. In the centre of Auckland, at the middle of night, you can see maybe 200 stars. On Waiheke, maybe 2,000 to 3,000 stars. On Great Barrier, five to six. This is a very unique place. Our readings were actually better on first cut than the readings that are uh, obtained in the reserve area of Tekapo around Mount John. We have better, darker skies on the barrier than probably anywhere else in New Zealand. That's worth protecting. We took a draft submission to the IDA, and that has come back, and there are some relatively minor details that we will have to go through with the planning department to ensure that we get um, precisely the regulatory structure they require. 
I'm working with planners at the moment in, in harmonizing that. Uh, the difficulty we appreciate is the barrier at the moment is operating under uh, the Hauraki Golf Plan. Um, that doesn't quite meet the standards, but we would hope that the submission that we will put to you eventually uh, would have you accepting the IDA detail as precise requirements for planning on Great Barrier. The planning regime is the best place to put the legal protection and the legal defence for this. We're running in a very short deadline. For completely arbitrary reasons, we would like to be able to do the launch at Matariki this year. This means we actually have to have the sort of terminology of intent and the statements of intent and the guidelines acceptable to the IDA in place pretty well at the end of March. We're working very hard and I'd like to express appreciation here to the planners, Jal Machada, uh, Peter Var Abasi and Anna Constantinou who are working with me to do this. We will need a change to the, we will need a section in the unitary plan when it is adjusted to the barrier that recognises dark sky status and protects it and requires that the discretionary level of consent is applied in all instances. Again, we're talking about outside light, not indoor light. Why is it important? Technology change. At the moment, we are pristine and pure on the barrier because we have no choice. It is too expensive to run your generators. We have solar panels. These things are changing. The solar technology is meant that the power of the solar panels now is such you can actually get enormous power from relatively simple and very cheap technology. Battery technology is changing. The worst case scenario would be some extreme egotist to stand for elected position in some large country, putting his name in permanent lights blazed up into the sky forever. At the moment, we're protected. We need that to remain. My analogy is for the rats. Imagine what it would have been like if we'd had the protection when the first ship arrived. And that's what we're looking for. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. And thank you, Izzy. More than an interesting concept, members. Are there questions of Izzy and Richard? Councillor Lee. Richard uh, and Izzy, thank you very much. Um, can you just confirm in regard to Tekapo? which I understand is uh, a, a, an international draw card for astronomers and um, people who like to look at the, at the heavens. Are you saying that barrier, the sky over barrier is as dark as at Tekapo? Uh, Councillor Lee, thank you. Uh, yes, um, actually it's darker. We, we thought the problem would be on the barrier's west coast where it faces Auckland. In fact, our darkest readings on the night of the uh, tests were from the west coast. Uh, you can see a slight light glow from Auckland, but it's extremely light. Uh, you can actually see major planets setting in the west through the lights of Auckland, so it is darker. Uh, to give you an idea of where the, this goes, um, Tekapo has in excess now of 100,000 to 200,000, I think, I'm not, I can c confirm those figures if necessary, but about 100,000 uh, tourists per year paying several hundred each for the privilege of walking up on the mountain, getting cold and looking at the skies. It has enormous potential economically. Uh, the Tekapo people have been very supportive and they would be delighted for an equivalent type of structure to arise on the barrier simply because Tekapo is full. Um, the idea being, one of the ideas being, this is we're not talking about mass tourism or anything like that, but as an economic driver, you don't need necessarily to go to Tekapo if you're visiting Auckland. You can see the dark skies from the barrier. This is an Auckland initiative, not just a barrier initiative. <coughs> can I just ask um, one more question? In terms of uh, plan changes um, and the unitary plan, um, are there any steps on Great Barrier to request voluntary compliance in regard to outdoor lighting? 
Richard, if you could just back off the mic a little bit, it's quite sensitive, right. and yeah. we'll hear you more clearly. Okay, thanks. Uh, <laughs> the irony is we actually don't need <laughs> the voluntary compliance. As I said, we only have four lights that are actually even vaguely near that. One of them uh, has been resolved when I talked to Izzy. Um, it, in terms of voluntary compliance, I've talked to two people um, of the other other recognised lights and they were turned off. I think when this is launched, there will need to be a, a campaign and leaflets and that sort of thing. So far, informally on the barrier, we've had only support. Um, I've had no significant resistance to it from anyone. And I think that would be the same, wouldn't it? Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Cooper. Thank you. Thank you. That's a magnificent display there. Um, I'm really supportive of the idea. I just wanted to know, but following on from Councillor Lee's question, if there's <coughs> any absentee landowners who you might not have canvassed that may, you know, following on your conversations about solar power capacity, etc., then in the future you think might be planning something that could be um, not so supportive of this? Is there any that kind of scenario going on? Um, not as yet. Uh, the the actual planning terms in the unitary plan are exceedingly complex and have never been used, as far as I'm aware. Um, we are looking at what the technical differences are between the IDA specifications and the existing plan specifications. In broad terms, the plan does provide for protection of the night sky. Now, that's a very generalised phrase. Whether it meets the uh, IDA's requirements, um, they will probably give us time to get, the, get it in adjustment, which brings us into the unitary plan process. I don't know. Um, the council officers that I've spoken to believe that they could, to some degree, apply as if that rule applied on the grounds that lighting, outdoor lighting that goes outside some very broad parameters is a discretionary activity anyway. So that might be it. But um, in terms of, I don't think at the moment anyone is planning to do massive lighting. The technology is beginning, but it's there. Um, but I, I mean, we, I think we have to act and we have to act fairly quickly to, uh, to bring it in. I'm not, I mean, one of the options is to ask for a plan change to the Hauraki Golf uh, District plan. Now, I don't see that that will be necessary, but in the worst case scenario, you'll have me back in a month's time asking for a plan change. Okay, thank you, Richard. Thank just you, just following on from oh, that sorry. as well, Councillor Cooper, I did approach Vector to see if they had any um, intention or aspirations to provide reticulated power. They don't want to know about oh, it. So, okay. <laughs> safe in that field. Good. Councillor Walker? Well, can you um, just give us an idea of the, the global context around this? I mean, how many other, uh, are there a lot of places that have this dark sky? Uh, the, the wording we've heard is there are approximately three or four so that have one. sanctuary status. There are a few more that have reserve status. Reserve is a higher status with much tighter legal thresholds. Um, the reason being is most of the reserves are closely associated with observatories and in places that you wouldn't want to visit anyway, you know, the top of a mountain in Chile, for example. Um, Tekapo has reserve status, and that's largely driven by Mount John Observatory. And to some extent, Tekapo tacked the tourism business onto the fact that it had Mount, Mount John. Um, I, I'm only partially arguing for a tourist response here. The major reason is to protect it as an irreplaceable asset that we have at the moment, and we don't want to lose. Thank you. And finally, Councillor Simpson. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, thanks, for Izzy, uh, Izzy and Richard. Uh, you mentioned in your presentation you thanked some of the planning staff for their support at Council. Can you just confirm what they've supported you to do to date, and what, if anything, you need them to do for the future? I, I, was, I was discussing it with them yesterday. Um, to date, we've uh, we fired the complex rules of the IDA to them and the, um, they reviewed existing plans, existing um, regional policy statements, etc., all the way basically through the RMA hierarchy and came up with the, their interpretations of what the current rules